I'm Susanna Lehner from the German Aerospace Center, and I would have a question, a transatlantic question, to Seacor and here to, to, to Pathetic Project as well. And I think uh, we as well did a lot of science on the on, on these services that are now existing, and so we cannot only see the ships and produce these maps, but we can do new re near real-time services. And so what would be the next science issues? This really combines nicely, and you are going into practical business now. What would be the next step in science, combining radar set, terrace, uh, remote sensing, satellite systems? That would be interesting. Canadian and German organization in science that could, as well with Helmholtz, do some good things. Yeah. And I would like a German-Canadian answer. So first, if it's okay, I would like to ask Sherry for her answer and then have your answer to that question. I'll go first. Um, so basically, I, I think that there's a near real time uh, requirement that's, that, that's needed here and that we need to take on the benefits of both the satellites and uh, both the C-band and the X-band and try to bring that together. Also investigate and look more at um, how much time it takes to get to the bridge of ships. Some satellites are more operational than others, such as these, the Sentinel satellites. So I think that we need to use a combination of sa uh, sensors from different countries, different space agencies, and take the benefits from those and merge them together. That Thank you, Camilla. Answer your question. I actually exactly agree with this. I think real time is an issue, but this is probably going to be solved within the next couple of years. If you think of uh, AIS, for instance, that's now going to be uh, deployed on the Iridium Next uh, constellation, so we have real time AIS in that case. So I think what, what we need to do in the next couple of years is to try to get the commercial satellite operators to work together more than they did in the past because they can create a large pool of data that is there already, heterogeneous data from many different sensors. If we get these guys to work together and build a pool of data that we can access with our programs and projects, then this is a huge step forward. Now it is very cumbersome to buy this set of data from that operator, another set from data from another operator again. Sometimes they don't work together, so you can only buy from one of them. But if we can actually build and access an entire pool of commercial satellite data, this brings us a large step ahead, in my opinion. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, normally we would start now in the coffee break, but I wanna give, give us again some five minutes or so for questions and answers. And I have another question here in Berlin. And Hannes, then it would be for you to check for questions in Halifax. Uh, yeah, two quick comments and uh, one quick question. Uh, I see a lot of very interesting uh, cooperation between industry, research organization. I want to take this opportunity to let you know that in last September, the Minister of Science visited. And we now have a direct cooperation between the ZIM program and NRC IRAP. And there's a, presently a call ongoing at the moment, but the dates are flexible. So I'd like you to make sure if you are looking to pursue some further cooperation of that nature, this is an interesting tool that's became available and we can give you more information at the embassy. Uh, last quick, the second quick comment is on I interestingly notice as a New Brunswick car where you put the Bay of Fundy, you put it in Nova Scotia, maybe <laughs> it was kind of an interesting uh, point of view for me as a, as a person from New Brunswick. But on a quick question was related to the tactic project. Uh, do you see any advantages uh, or, uh, because you talked about these issues now about use integration of data uh, when it comes to ice monitoring uh, between the C-band and the X-band data? Uh, the, the responsible for Cheryl, yeah, from. Okay. And that was Gisela? Gisela from the Canadian Embassy here in Berlin. Sherry? Actually, we're, we're just starting to investigate that as uh, part of one of our work packages. Um, so, uh, and we're actually doing that collaboratively with Airbus. Uh, so I should know the answer to that in about five or six months, more exactly how they, we plan to put these synergies together and, and to, to put our results, our project results together. So I, I technically don't have an answer for you right now. Thank you. Hannes, questions on Halifax? Yes, one more question over here. Yeah. 
Anthony Eisner with uh, Defense Research and Development Canada. I have a question to the passages uh, presenter, and it's actually related to the question, uh, this question not just asked at the previous one to that, about what comes next. I'm wondering about, uh, the, the response to that question was a very sensor-focused response, com combining data sets and things of that nature. So when I look at the passages uh, slides, one of your first slides had situational or situation awareness on it. And I'm wondering if passages uh, tried to scope any progress on the aspect of the awareness piece. Thank you. Camilla? Well, awareness is, is I would say, part of our core business, what we do at uh, Airbus. If we generate situation pictures, we always try to generate awareness by um, interpreting the data as much as we can and displaying this to the um, operator who works with that. So um, I'm not exactly sure what more you have in mind when you ask me about awareness. So the, the idea is to really give the end user the opportunity to fully understand and interpret the data and base meaningful actions on these data. And route planning, I think, is a good example for that. We see you. Yeah, the, qu the question was, and in fact, in your slide deck later on, you changed situation awareness to actually situational picture. And I see those two things as very different because I see the awareness as closer to the cognitive side, something that's generated in the human's mind. The picture is a piece of that, uh, and it certainly helps, but I'm, I'm, that was the basis of my question. Yeah, so then the ans answer is depending on the data that we get, we can go far beyond a situation picture we can generate situation awareness, and usually this is what we try to achieve. And I would like to invite the two of you to use our um, <coughs> two laptops during the coffee break to perhaps get in touch personally through the app and, and discuss that further and make sure that you stay in touch. Hannes, I have one more question over here in Berlin. You can check for one more in Halifax, then we have coffee. Thank you. My name is Peter Baumann from Jacobs University in Bremen. And first of all, being a computer scientist, I would like to phrase my deep appreciation of that engineering work that I'm seeing here. I'm learning a lot today. Uh, and the one thing that I'm learning also is it's about data. And this is what we are doing coming from that area. I sense that you want to process more data and you want to connect data more. That seems to be a common attitude across different talks. Uh, maybe we can uh, contribute a facet here with the Earth Survey Initiative where we try to build up a planetary scale federation with lots of data centers joining and bringing in their data and then allowing an automatic combination. So for example, we have Sentinel data, currently 250 terabyte as spatial temporal data cubes and we are going to unleash the climate data of the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, which is going to be 120 petabyte. So all of that we want to unleash, and maybe it makes sense to connect that. If so, I would be very happy to enter in a conversation. Who would you like to have a conversation with? I see this as an overarching theme, so I would be happy to uh, talk to any of you. Okay. <laughs> And in case you also need a second approach to understand what Peter is talking about, like I did the first, we will present later um, in our second um, part of the conversation, and we will talk about that. Would you like to respond to that, any of you? Sherry, Doug? Just, um, just a um, fairly trivial comment back, I guess, is that uh, I, I think that this is really the the centerpiece of making progress for a whole bunch of questions, as you're aware. That's why you're, you're doing it. And the awareness, of, especially, of what is going on in Germany, what is going on in Europe, versus uh, in, in what is going on in Canada, raising the awareness of what is going on so that we can work together and be prepared for the, 
the products as they're unleashed and ready to use them. That's really important and it's an important aspect of the, the dialogue we're having because um, you know, while many of us work in both, uh, both in Europe and in, in North America, it's still the case that the internal communication within Europe is tighter because of EU projects and so on, and national projects. So this kind of transatlantic dialogue is so important to make sure that we're aware and ready to utilize new capacity as it's, uh, as you pointed out, unleashed. And I'm very happy to get somehow the feeling that the German-Canadian conquerors with this year's topic could give a contribution to that work of yours and, and to all of you. And I am still want you to be awake for a second part. That's why I give you now time for coffee and tea. Um, I will see you again quarter to um, four here, which Alex. is... Alex. Yeah, Hannes? Hannes? Sorry, can I interrupt you? We, we had another question over here, and he's already standing here, so... That's an... Okay, that's okay. After on. that, we go for coffee <laughs> and meet again at quarter to. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Thank you very much. I hate to keep people from coffee, but I do have a uh, question for um, Dr. Wallace. And uh, looking at uh, your, your beautiful picture about um, CO2 concentration in the Atlantic, etc., and where there's a, uh, a fairly large hole in the Labrador Sea, uh, with the exception of the work that was done back in the 1990s in terms of getting real-time data, that you are doing an enormous amount of extrapolation you know, for what's gone on in the past. However, there have been vessels that have been transiting those areas for a very, very long time um, in defense-related uh, activities. And I'm just, my question has two parts. Uh, firstly, are you uh, taking steps to see what you can do from various departments of defense to extrapolate data from uh, those vessels that have been going through there? And then secondly, uh, what are you doing to um, utilize vessels of convenience that go up there all the time? Because the Navy's up there all the time, the Coast Guard is up there all the time, uh, there, are, there are oil exploration uh, vessels up there. And what are you doing then to utilize them, they're transiting all the time, uh, so you can, uh, without having to have your own special purpose. And I recognize that you're doing data collection, but that's one point, one time. Thank you. Excellent, excellent question. Um, just see if the mic's on, yeah. An excellent question, an excellent point. Um, so, we do have a, a gap in data in that region, not to say there's zero data, I don't, you know, certainly Bedford Institute uh, have done a, a remarkable job in keeping a monitoring program going there each year, but it's uh, generally one point in time per year. Uh, the year-round coverage is, is usually lacking. Um, and I do agree that the way forward is to make maximum ut utilization of vessels which are going through the region. In terms of extracting data from DND and DRDC vessels that have been working in the region in the past. I've personally not done much, and I'm sure there is a wealth of data that can be, can, is there which can be helped, helped with this extrapolation process. So certainly we should do something to look retrospectively uh, with those types of data. But I think the real key now is to, to make the max, for actually in the entire northern part of Canada, this vast ocean space that we have where there's limited data collection, and increasing importance of that region. Um, as was pointed out also in the passages uh, uh, presentation, the need to use ships of opportunity or uh, pretty much any platform which is transiting that region for collection of data and reporting of data is there. So what we think is necessary in that is to develop the systems which are robust enough where they can be re reliably installed, operated, maintained by non-specialist uh, personnel. And um, certainly Mealpar is interested in that. I had a discussion yesterday, actually, with uh, the head of DND's METOC program, uh, specifically about that, uh, about and also, you know, with Dan Hutt from DRDC, specifically about uh, the possibility of installing these types of systems on DND uh, vessels. And I think the opportunity is there. But the scientific, res the responsibility of the scientists is to make sure that the systems are rugged, reliable uh, enough to be installed and maintained, and we're, we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. So it's a two-way thing, but I think that's the key, is uh, expanding the platforms, especially through ships of opportunity for a variety, a kind of increasing variety of data collection.